Hello, and welcome to Sensational, the special educational needs podcast brought to you by With A Slack Group. My name's Laura, I'm a senior occupational therapist for Group, and we have SEN schools all over the country and support almost 2,000 young people and their families every day. More importantly, I'm a mum of two children, one of whom is neurodivergent, and I'm here to host our monthly podcast where I'll be asking our special guests the questions that you and I want the answers to, whether you're a parent, carer, grandparent or professional, our advice, guidance and practical strategies for you to try at home will enable you to empower your children and your young people. Our regular listeners might be able to tell we've had a bit of a makeover. So for those listening, you can now watch our episodes on YouTube. We really want you to be involved and have your questions answered. So please find us on Instagram and Facebook by searching with a Slack group or submit your questions via email. A new episode of Sensational will be released on the first Monday of every month and it'll be available on all podcast streaming services and YouTube. So sit back, relax and enjoy this episode. And if you like what you hear, hit like and subscribe. In this episode, we are joined by Tony Lloyd and Anne-Marie Harrison. And today we're going to be discussing all things neurodiversity, understanding and navigating neurodiversity. So welcome back, both of you. Welcome back to the podcast. Hello again, Before we Laura. begin, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Tony, go hey, on. <laughs> um, what can I tell you? I'm the CEO of the ADHD Foundation Neurodiversity Charity. Um, I have ADHD myself. Um, I'm happily married to Colin for 28 years, who is dyspraxic, um, and have worked in the field of neurodiversity for the past 30 years plus. Fab, thank you. Anne-Marie? I think we've got about 70 years experience here on the couch for <laughs> journey, <laughs> which is a bit scary, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here. I'm uh, an independent trainer. I run my own um, training business for autism and neurodiversity and uh, called Ideas Afresh. And um, uh, ironically, my logo is actually a lighthouse. So oh. I'm kind of, whilst uh, there's some sort of, curiosities around navigating neurodiversity. I like the idea of shining a light over what are the wonderful potentials of neurodiversity and I meet lots of those within my own family and professional life as well. So really Fantastic. looking forward to chatting to yeah, you. That really aligns with how I think too. Fabulous. So today we're going to be discussing all things neurodiversity. Um, it might be a fairly new term to some of our listeners mm -hmm. today um, and it obviously describes brain difference and, and kind of helps to support our knowledge and understanding of a lot of, of different neurodiverse brains. So for any listeners who are totally new to this term, can you give us a little bit of um, explanation about, about what it means? I think neurodiversity is a natural expression of this incredible diversity of mind that exists in the human species and that there are these naturally occurring differences that have not been as visible to, to many people um, as they are now, but a real recognition that we all think differently. We all have a unique mind. Um, every human being on this planet is uniquely different. Nobody looks the same and sounds the same and everybody's brain is, is unique to them. So it is recognising that we don't all think the same way and that the universal design is that we think differently. And if one in five of us have one of these naturally occurring different neurotypes, such as dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, autism, dyscalculia, um, then there's got to be an evolutionary reason why at least, at least one fifth of all human beings have one of these different minds. I love too the diversity within the diversity. And I, I think, yeah. um, you know, for some people, um, there are moments in their lives and probably people listening to this podcast now where their diversity will be a villain one day and a hero the next day. And, <laughs> you know, I've had moments like that in, in my life. And, um, you know, you, you could be that, that, you know, grandma who's like listening to, uh, your child, you know, reading way before their age or um, articulating some experience. And then the next minute, you know, the villain strikes and they're the one that's frustrated and not coping with the sort of relatively simple demands of a school day. So, you know, there's so much diversity, isn't there, within 
diversity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes it's a hero and sometimes it's a villain. Yeah. yeah. I think the other thing as well is we like, I mean, we like labels because we like to order things. They help us stratify things, don't they? I don't like labels with D's in them, though. Yeah. Um, you know, disorder or condition, as you were saying before, yeah, yeah. Anne-Marie, um, because there's a lot of stigma and I think yeah. um, misinformation and misconception around certain labels. Labels yeah. can be helpful, but they can be constraining. And this idea that, you know, well, all people who are autistic are like this, or all people who are ADHD yeah. are like this, I think is, is very, very unhelpful. Yeah. It's very difficult. And I, I as a parent, I've, I've said before that my daughter's autistic, absolutely put my foot down in school and said, because it's the diagnostic label, ASD, autism spectrum disorder or condition, yeah. you might see it as ASC as condition, that's on her diagnostic report. Mm -hmm. And I was really clear to the school from this day forward that doesn't appear in anything else that's written about my child because she's yeah. not disordered no. and she doesn't have a condition and no. it's a very it's a very tricky label it's there yeah. because that's how how we diagnose but absolutely I, I put my foot down and said yeah. it's not happening because yeah. she's not and it's, <laughs> yeah. an evol it's an evolving language isn't it and it's yeah. evolving conversation Laura Amory and I were talking about this recently as well about you know I mean right up until 1994 you were classed as mentally ill if you were gay mm in the medical manual yeah. and some of the words that have been in the DSM medical manual that have been used to describe people of colour or people who are autistic uh, or ADHD, um, we no longer use. Um, the language is evolving and, and the cultural context is influencing that language and, yeah. and hopefully we're moving away from language that implies somebody is less than that others people, that kind of implies that other people don't belong, they're not one of us. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of parents like you, Laura, who who yeah. will not have their child spoken about as disordered or having a condition. Yeah. Yes, they're different. Yes, they have different needs. Yes, they learn differently. They also have different strengths and different mm -hmm. abilities. Absolutely. And, you know, too often we're looking at our children through the lens of deficit rather than their humanity and all of that, because, you know, we're all different mm. and we all have challenges and strengths in different ways. Absolutely. And, and I think you're right when you say about language evolving. And, I, you know, I think back when I first started working um, certainly for the National Autistic Society many, many years ago. And we were, you know, trained that we had to refer to children as children with autism. And of course, now that's a real no-no. Mm. And uh, children who were then children are now adults and said, you know, I didn't carry my autism around like a handbag. It's part of who I am. It's it's just me. It's, it's just the age the of identity, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really, that there, there are a lot of people for whom this is how I identify. I am autistic. I am ADHD in the same way, you know, yeah. I am gay. I am straight. It's an important part of their identity. Yeah. yeah. I think we need to be careful that we don't impose those kind of things on people. I think we've got to let this conversation evolve Yeah. yeah. and let the community themselves choose how they identify. Yeah. And the individual. Yeah. 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 You know, ask, yeah. it's really important to ask the individual, you know, yeah. if, you know, we're going to be talking in these terms, what's comfortable for you? What, what yeah. Are, yeah. So we've talked a little bit about there about how um, language has evolved, but how has our understanding of neurodiversity evolved over time in your experience? I, th I think massively. I would say um, one of the reasons actually that I kind of shifted towards um becoming an independent operator was because at the time um, the areas in which I was working were becoming very self-constrained in that um, if you didn't have a diagnostic label of such a thing, then you couldn't access such a service. And then if you didn't have a diagnostic label in another thing, then you couldn't accept that service. And I think particularly what the ADHD Foundation charity have done is really work on that whole umbrella of understanding neurodiversity and getting away from that very segregated kind mm. of, we're just socially trying to put round pegs into square holes and mm. there's mm. there's nothing to be gained mm. by that. And I think human intelligences and the different neurotypes like dyslexia, radiation, they are all spectrums. And yeah. I know some people get a bit offended with it. Well, we're not all a little bit ADHD. Well, actually, we are all a little bit ADHD and we are all a little bit autistic. It's not like we've got things that 
other people don't have. It's just that there are certain parts of our brains that are more pronounced in some ways um, and less pronounced in others. Mm. Um, and they often overlap. We know, for example, that um, there is a very strong genetic overlap between ADHD and autism. Yeah. And that it's estimates that 55% of people with a primary diagnosis of autism are also ADHD. Mm. Uh, and those are the primary diagnosis of ADHD, about 29% are also meet the diagnostic criteria for ADHD, uh, for autism rather. So there is yeah. this overlap. 43% of people with ADHD are also dyslexic. And I think that you know, there is this arbitrary line, isn't there, created by a, a medical researcher at one time yeah. that, well, this is the point at which it's defined as a diagnosis. I'd like to get to the point where we don't refer to any of them as a diagnosis. I think I'd like to say a classification because I think it helps to have an understanding. Labels can help us yeah, yeah. understand things and identify things that are not always visible. Um, but sometimes those labels can yeah. can be negative and yeah. stigmatising and harmful. It can be, and, yeah. And as Anne-Marie said, I think uh, th 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 there is a complex overlap with all of it, isn't yeah, there? Absolutely is. And even within, I think, our understanding of each of the diagnostic terms, I think even that's evolving. And we were just talking earlier about things like um, autism, for example. Classically, you know, I still will hear families saying, oh, but I thought it, it can't possibly be autism because he's so sociable and he loves everybody and you know each each element of those kind of diagnostic criteria that we see in those medical manuals has got its own spectrum within it and so the more we try and marginalize and narrow down then the less mm. inclined we are to move forwards we're just kind of suffocating ourselves and and fragmenting everything and I think the more holistic we can be in supporting yeah. the families that we work with and the families that we live with and ourselves. Then the stereotypes kind of, are unhelpful, aren't they? Are, they? And, and, and and I think you know we've got to move away from we've got to move away from that. Like yeah. I said, I think yeah. I think I understand that, that that we live in a culture at the minute where your child's learning needs and strengths um, need to be identified. Yeah. So. While we use the term diagnosis currently, I'm in favour of that. I, I think it helps people understand themselves. It's like, now I know why I think this way. Yeah. When I found out at 29 that I had ADHD, it was this real epiphany of, right, that's that's why I do that. That's why that, you know, it really does help. But I don't like the acronym and I certainly don't consider myself to have a deficit mm. and I certainly yeah. don't consider myself disordered and I certainly don't consider myself disabled. If you said to me, were you disabled at school? The answer is definitely because I was an academically gifted kid who just didn't achieve anything like his potential because apparently I was lazy. But in fact, it wasn't. It just had really poor memory, which meant I did really badly in exams. You didn't have the right support strategies in place to help you. But I didn't, yeah, yeah. I didn't understand. If it, You know, once I mm. learned at 29, I went back to university for a second time um, to do a couple of master's degrees and a doctorate. But how by you, that time, you do? I learned... That's why Tony's along. But He's that the time, academic. <laughs> that, but, but the thing is, I, I knew then, this is how I learn. If I'm going to do... So you know big what piece of research and a right, 80,000 word assignment. There are certain strategies I need in place in order for me to learn. Exactly. Mm. So That's then so I was able it? to achieve in a way that I, I wasn't at school. So I think yeah. the context of the school disabled me. I was disabled as a child. Yeah. I was disabled by the context yeah, I would and agree. By, mm. the, by the educational paradigm yeah. and the very narrow, uh, outdated notion of what yeah. intelligence was and, yeah. that, and and how you how you evidence your intelligence and your ability. Yeah. Um, so I think it's helpful to have, you know, a diagnosis. I know a lot of parents yeah. believe that you can't you can't get your child's needs met without a diagnosis, and sadly, that is in the case. In our culture, that's but often the I'd case. I'd like to think at some point in the not too distant future, we educate 
all children and we are inclusive yeah. of all children. And, and we notice, like we notice those differences, you know. Yeah. I, I can really relate to lots of, of what you're saying, Tony, but, you know, I was I was the little girl that went off to the park with a Mars bar at lunchtime because I couldn't cope with the constantly feeling awkward and out of place and this wasn't where I belonged and I seemed to get everything wrong and you know I, I'm still that person in many ways my sister was just staying with me recently and I misread the clock which is very common <laughs> <laughs> so I took her a cup of tea at three o'clock in the morning oh my goodness. <laughs> thinking oh she'll be delighted <laughs> it's eight o'clock in the morning <laughs> and here you know she's having a break with yeah. me and then on, on the way back when I realized it was three o'clock in the morning because she very kindly informed me of the fact I tripped over and dropped the tray oh. and spilled the tea all down the wall and woke her up very permanently anyway. Yeah. So, you know, I'm still kind of that person battling with all of those things. Yeah. But I think the more that um, people understand that that's just part of who you are and you, you kind of, to an element, learn to sort of smile about it, mm -hmm. But also that actually teachers appreciate that it's not that children are being awkward or difficult or pedantic, that they or are badly behaved. Or badly yeah. behaved. Just because, you know, they're just yeah. being and they're being their best selves they can. And that might mean sometimes, you know, you misread something. Yeah. Or you drop yeah. something. Or you have to ask a few more questions. Exactly. And to get okay. You haven't yeah. processed what's yeah. being expected of you mm. and you've got that mm. wrong and that it's not mm. that they are setting out to create yeah. that chaos. Yeah. I remember as a child having to really focus on eye contact while because I find it easier to yeah. concentrate when I'm looking down and doodling that, that I... I find it harder to concentrate when I'm looking at somebody in the eye, but I also know that it, it's respectful and everything else, to, but it's not, it doesn't come naturally. Yeah. You know, it doesn't come naturally yeah. to me to do so. And and when I kind of realised that people might have thought I was being rude or not paying attention, or <clears throat> if I interrupted, it wasn't because I was being rude or disrespectful. It was just because... Sometimes it was like, if I don't say this now, I'm going to forget it. Or it would just come yeah. out and I'd not even know that I'd yeah. done it. Or sometimes I'd think I'd said it and I hadn't even actually been articulated mm. but in my head. I like had, yeah. Because my brain is working faster than than my inhibitory control, if you like. Yeah. You have touched on it a little bit through the conversation, <laughs> but I wonder if you could help us to understand some of perhaps, let's say, the lesser known, the less common um, or less spoken about um, differences, brain differences, neurodiversity you know, diversities. It's an interesting one about what comes under this umbrella because yeah. I think traditionally the idea was coined around autism, wasn't mm. it? And then it kind of incorporated the naturally occurring neurodiversities, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, that are really common. Um, but dysgraphia and um, synesthesia, and there's there's quite a well, few I'm, others, isn't I, there, I, that are quite I, different. I really. kind of... I, I'm a bit mixed on my honest opinions on how we are becoming so fragmented. So, mm -hmm. for example, when I was first working in the, you know, field of special needs and um, certainly in the autistic community, the, there was a, a knowledge that part and parcel of that autistic profile included things like maybe... Um, less uh, skillful in explaining your own emotions or um, perhaps uh, differences in your eating preferences and and those kinds of, of, mm. of profiles. And now they, they're kind of becoming quite separated. So we've got alexemia mm. and... Um, Sensory uh, processing. Yeah, disorder, yeah, disorder. And so uh, these things are, are getting... All parts know, of the same spectrum, aren't they? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, but they're actually are part of that holistic person. And when we start putting lots of big words around mm. to um, explain these things, I think the general population our teachers, our school populations, our parents go into panic mode and think it's overwhelming and they can't get their head around it all. And actually, it's not its not a big monster, no. as Tony rightly mm. says. It's really just 
part and parcel of how everybody is, but some people's profiles are a little bit more obvious or apparent in certain areas than others. I think there are also some people who want to include illnesses like Parkinson's, which is a neurodegenerative yeah. disease, mm. as fallen under the banner of neurodiversity. Um, and it's not for me to say that they shouldn't be. Um, but I do draw a distinction between naturally occurring neurocognitive sort of neurotypes like dyslexia, autism, ADHD, and illnesses yeah. that, that are a, a pathology that can happen yeah. for whatever different reason and often quite late in life. Um, I think there is a distinction, but they may still, you know, it's not for me to say whether that, you know, that, that that's uh, included under the umbrella of neurodiversity or not. But I think generally speaking, it's more often than not viewed as those naturally occurring different types of thinking as opposed to, you know, we don't think of and shouldn't think of autism or dyslexia as being an illness or a, you know, this yeah. dis, you know, this, this dis word that mm. we have, mm -hmm. um, which means without less than mm. something missing. Um, and they're not something missing. Mm. And I think they are quite different. We shouldn't be talking about cause and cure so much as yeah. we should be talking about how do we really understand and embrace something that is a natural phenomenon. Yeah. That is the universal design. I think that that really leads really nicely on to the next question. I'm going to read from my cue card just so I make sure that I get this right. But we're having a bit of a think about how we can differentiate between what you might class as neurotypical childhood development and behaviours and any potential signs of neurodevelopmental differences in children. And where might it be helpful parents to seek a bit of professional help around that? I, I get asked this an awful lot, with um, particularly with young uh, families, um, who are worrying that perhaps their toddler isn't sort of um, reaching those very well published toddler goals. Yeah, those milestones. And, <laughs> those milestones, yeah. exactly. And of course, at part, you know, at the um, age two check, when we've got that um, CHAT test, the childhood autism um, scale, which we're starting to sort of notice and, and look for any early indications as a society. And I think in many ways that's a positive move for families because we know that the earlier we can support um, social activities and social interventions, then the better the outcomes in the long term for the child. But I think there's also comes with that a real danger mm. that we're, we're sort of, again, starting to segregate um, development much, much more, much quicker than we necessarily perhaps need to, because development is individual to each child, yep. as we know. And I think, you know, COVID so certainly revealed that, you know, yeah. I work with young families whose children came on fantastically well because of that opportunity for less pressure, less demand. And then um, other families who, you know, were in panic mode because they felt their children weren't developing as, as well as they could. Mm -hmm. And so to try and differentiate between typical and non-typical development, mm. is a, it's a really tricky area, mm. isn't it? I think the other thing as well about, you know, this... We've got to be careful about creating dichotomies, you know, where you're either neurotypical yeah. or, or, you're, or you're neurodiverse yeah. or neurodivergent, <laughs> depending on which term you prefer. Um, we can't just have this binary concept of humankind as, well, this lot over here are neurodiverse or, or neurodivergent, this lot over here are yeah. neurotypical. I don't, I don't think it's helpful because, no. again, you are talking about this incredible diversity of 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 mind the spectrum of human intelligences and and potential and ability is is just incomprehensible we don't understand anything yet really about what our brain and nervous systems are capable of and can do um and i think sometimes we can oversimplify it and i think rather than want to confine an order and box in, yeah. actually become a little bit more comfortable with the fact that actually some things, you know, I, I talking to Colin, my husband, we just kind of have this conversation about, because C Colin has, has dyspraxia and he, he's a very, very intelligent 
lovely, kind man who thinks in this super linear way. He's so organised and I'm kind of, well, I'm not that with my ADHD kind of brain. Um, and he'll be fascinated and say, well, how did you get from that point to that, that point? It's yeah. like, I, you know, and, and I, I think, well, I don't know. That's just kind of how my brain works. Um, and when we work together, it's actually fascinating because we produce some really good quality work because he has this lovely linear, logical, sequential kind of mm. way of processing information. And I have this kind of these streams of consciousness and he described it as, he said, my brain's a bit like a torchlight and yours is a bit like a kaleidoscope. Oh, yeah. um, and actually, if you if you look at the origins of the way kaleidoscope, you're just thinking, yeah, actually yeah. that kind of, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. Um, but we're not all meant to think no. the same way. This is no. the whole point. Yeah. And I think you, you use the most important word there, Tony, when you say humankind. Yeah. And I think that's that's where we need to come from. We need to be kind in supporting our children from birth, you know, to we we leave them or mm. anything else ever happens, that actually we just support them on their pathway of development mm at the stages they're at in the best possible way yeah. we can. Yeah. I do, although I think we've got to acknowledge, I say humankind, but let's we, we cannot ignore the fact that historically there has been a very significant gender bias whereby the great majority of girls in school and women who are dyslexic, autistic, ADHD, dyspraxic, dyscalculia, have been completely overlooked. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can ignore that. Yeah. You know, the, the, it was often seen as a boy's thing, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah historically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the many of those myths, and, isn't it? Yeah, and also why, you know, why did, why did we not see these, these girls in school? Why, why were they overlooked? Why were they just labelled chatterboxes or ditzy um, or, or, you know, or overtly quiet and shy. Do you know what I mean? Why? Or yeah. or just not very bright was you know, yeah. as if it didn't kind of matter as much if girls weren't achieving in yeah. school. And I think we've moved a long way in terms of educational achievement for girls in school, but we still miss the majority. The yeah. the diagnostic ratio is still three or four boys yeah. to every girl. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we know that one in ten children are dyslexic. And in our schools, only two out of every 10 dyslexic children leave school at 16, knowing that they're, that they're dyslexic. Mm. So the other eight are going to underachieve. They're going to be marked down in every exam, no matter what subject, whether it's geography or history, because they're going to be marked down on their literacy because of their dyslexia. We insist they have to handwrite for three hours when everybody uses laptop computers. We live in a computer age. Then, you know, Spelling wouldn't be an issue. Um, you know, I think that... I wonder it, if kind of our desire to um, measure and assess neurotypical development is one of the contributory factors to the fact that we are overlooking some of those mm. obvious things. So, you know, we, we look like, let's take repetitive behaviour, for example, so in boys, you know, when they're playing, I'm very rooted in, you know, early years. So if they're playing with their cars in a less traditional way to their peers, then it's noticed very quickly. But if a little girl is making a cup of tea repeatedly and handing that to her dollies and does that in the same way all the time, everybody thinks, oh, isn't that sweet? Isn't that cute? Mm -hmm. And they yeah. miss the cue of repetitive behaviour. Because if you change the dolly or you ask the, the little girl to give well, you the tea, yeah. then it might be a different story. The cultural story. context is really important. I mean, you think, you know, we only started educating children in school, sat behind desk a couple hundred years ago. Well, human beings have been evolving for a couple hundred thousand years. And I don't think yep. that from an evolutionary perspective, children were designed for the way we socialise, educate parents and enculturate them now. And we get frustrated when they, they are not what we adults want them to be, according to what? And I know a lot of parents have felt that they've been shamed because their child isn't, you know, behaving in a way that the teacher thinks is appropriate in the classroom or isn't learning to the best, or their child is lazy and not trying hard enough and all these kind of things. Um, that I think we've got to understand that, you know, if a child is not achieving something, we ask the question, why is that the case and what do we have to do differently? Not 
what is wrong with the child. Exactly, exactly. And if we're going to look at measures, as you mentioned, Anne-Marie, about, you know, what progress a child should have made by a certain age, um, then I think equally when we're talking about what we measure in school in terms of, so exam results, and I'm a passionate believer in education, um, I'm a passionate believer in in academic excellence, um, and I think, you know, what gets measured gets done, uh, which is why I've always thought that citizenship should be a GCSE subject in schools. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but I think what we measure in, in exams is, is, it's not, you know, it's not intelligence, it's very narrow. We're measuring a certain degree of intellectual competence when we know intelligence is so much more than that. And yeah. I know when I I speak to a lot of chief executives of big global companies who are saying to me, the world has changed so much in the last 30 years. The workplace has changed so much. The kind of skills and competencies that we really want in an employee in our workforce are very different from what they were 30 years ago. And while 30 years ago, we might have thought that somebody who just graduated from university would have been exceptionally intelligent. Mm-hmm. Actually, in the context of the 21st century, which is rapidly technology-driven changing yes. workplace and world, we live in a 24-hour culture and global economy, that actually what we are educating children in our education system isn't really preparing them for the world of work. Yeah. And I know that I've been involved with one of the projects that we're the Slack run, which is called Futures Around, that really important transition from education to employment, because actually what it's represents that. a standard within education and academic competence, young people, when they're making that transition to adulthood and independent living and employment, there are very different skills Absolutely. and competencies that we... And that programme, we see so many beautiful success stories. Oh, it's amazing. What we call yeah. our kind of huge, small victories. Yeah. But amazing. it's absolutely incredible because yeah. of the way that we're looking at skills development and because, it, yeah. you know, we're looking at the pathways that are best explored by our, our children and young people. So, yeah, really successful. And that's it. Yeah. It's identifying yeah. those pathways of development, isn't it? And walking... And I still, I mean, I I still, you know, I I occasionally ask to tutor a student who was doing a a thesis. um, And I can see the difference in the type of learning skills from young people 20 years ago who were much more creative and lateral in their thinking. Whereas now a lot of university students, it's like you can tell they've been educated to pass an exam. Yeah. And there is a difference, I think. Um, You know, and that's, Again, no disrespect to a lot of very dedicated, hardworking teachers who was married, you know, been married to a teacher. Um, but I think I think the model and the paradigm is becoming obsolete because the world that we live in is changing at a pace that is faster than we are mm-hmm. able to adapt to. Yeah. So now we've come to the part of our podcast. It's a new part of our podcast where we're getting um, parents and carers and professionals to give us their questions so that they can be really involved at that level with our podcast. So I'm wondering if I could just jump in with a a, a kind of listener question. My eight-year-old doesn't attend school. He's diagnosed with autism and he's on the pathway for ADHD. I believe his ADHD is stopping him progressing in education and he's being labelled the naughty child, like we discussed before, because he can't control his emotions when he's being triggered at school. Any advice on how I can work with school to resolve this? My my kind of immediate thought in my head always when I hear those kinds of stories is when will we accept that communication is always, always, behaviour is always, always for a reason and mm-hmm. behaviour is either communicating or there's a reason or there's a reaction going on Mm -hmm. and this blame culture of you know blame the child and not looking at um why the child's reacting in the way they are why they're responding in the way they are why they're communicating the way they are and that's the lens we've got to use because then we can alter the environment we can alter the approach we can alter the way that we're going about things Mm -hmm. and if the child's not um at this point, able to participate in a school environment, then we need to look at, in my opinion, where the child 
can cope and where he can participate and therefore how can we merge those two yeah. skill sets as an OT that's that's absolutely everything that's my job that's music to my ears that's what we're looking at you know the think, environment yeah. and communication and how we support that participation and take it from not a problem within the child yeah it's how we support from that yeah. environmental I point think of view. it's also absolutely. getting away from this idea you know there's, there was this school of thought wasn't it well the child's choosing not to yeah. behave appropriately yeah and I was thinking how do you know that how do mm. you know you know, you, 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 essentially what we're saying is that me as an adult, um, I can't teach you because, you know, you're refusing to learn. Who's the grown up here? Mm. What do I need to do yeah. to enable this child to tap into that genetic love of yeah, learning? To make and things so engaging. Accessible, well, accessible and to so them. irresistible. You know, I, I use this word irresistible in terms of, you know, that's how we need to make our education system so that our children want to be there, they want to engage and they want to learn and there's something that's hooking them in. Mm. It's like you were saying earlier about their interests. You know, we can use those interests mm. and, you know, use their skills, then yeah. they will engage. They're yeah. not choosing yeah. not yeah. to. I mean, you know, let's be honest, you, you, when you leave, you know, I was talking before about a lot of successful people who are ND because you can choose careers and lifestyles that play to your cognitive strengths. Yeah. But when you're in school, you don't have that choice. And there are some lessons that you don't find interesting. Yeah. And I know when I was at school, and you come to choosing your options, you didn't choose options, you chose teachers. The genetic imperative is relationship <laughs> driven. I keep true. saying this. <laughs> Children will do anything for teachers or parents who, where they feel safe, where they are able to take risks with their learning and understand that making mistakes is, is, is the whole trial and error process of yeah. learning. Um, and that th they feel valued and encouraged in their learning. Often children disengage from learning because they're afraid of getting it wrong or they don't understand it or somehow the learning isn't getting through. I remember always being told off in school where I would put my hand up and ask the teacher for help and say, I, I can't, I don't know how to do this. And they go, yes, you, yes, you do. You did it last week and you got a great A in class. So you saying you can't remember how to do it, this, you're just being lazy. Well, actually I wasn't, I genuinely couldn't mm. remember okay. because yeah. I'd not, being able to process it into long-term mm -hmm. memory. And I learned, obviously, much later in life, how I embed things into long-term mm -hmm. memory. But we often look at the surface behaviour and make assumptions on the fact that this 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13-year-old thinks like an adult when they don't. Mm -hmm. They're a child and it's incumbent upon us to understand how they learn and how we engage yeah. them in learning and how we excite them yeah. about learning and encourage them to achieve their potential yeah. um, as not, opposed to just blame it all on the child or yeah. blame mm. it on the parent or Absolutely. blame it on somebody else because the chain of blame goes on and on and on, doesn't it? It's, um, I, I think we make assumptions about what children should be rather than mm. who children are and what we as adults as primary caregivers need to do to enable that child rather than disable yeah. mm -hmm. I My daughter had a teacher in year five and six and I used to say to him, he's a he's the greatest gift that was given to her because she would be lying on her tummy in class doing her learning. She'd be on the special cushion that he got for her. She had a desk of her own because she was that child that spreads mm. out because, mm -hmm. her, you know, her organisational skills, executive mm. functioning were, were a bit tricky. But I said to him, you know, sometimes... I find that that's going to be a, a real challenge because not everybody was as embracing and understanding that that's how she accessed her education. Yeah. Mm. And that was real tricky because he was this gift, but it was also, yeah. he's prepared this wonderful environment for her for her learning. And mm. sadly, at the point where we were, that wasn't always how it was going to be for her going forward. And it's, yeah. it's a real tricky one, yeah. that balance. And the, and the environment for the learning is really key. Absolutely, it's key. I'm working at the moment with a, a very uh, complex a uh, little girl, and um, she she re-engaged with school um, through having um, footsteps and taking a kind of Dora the Explorer um, 
aspect back into school and she had a little rucksack and all that sort of thing. But then once that became a routine, she's very anxiety driven. And uh, so now that routine has become an expectation. So now she's disengaged again. Mm. And that's very hard for teachers, particularly because they then feel, oh, I failed here. You know, we got her back in school and now she's not coming to school again. And of course, it's that depersonalizing because sometimes our children aren't about people pleasing. They're about coping with their environment mm. and the things we can do to help mm. them cope with their environment and understand mm. their reactions to those environments, I think is is really key. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I've seen, we, we both know many, many examples, don't we? Like, you know, the, the young child is so overwhelmed and distressed in the classroom. So they hide under the desk and the teacher saying they're being disobedient refused, and don't actually understand that the yeah. child is completely overwhelmed and having, uh, you know, from a, a, a neurological uh, perspective in fight or flight, complete meltdown, which is not the same as a tantrum. It's not the same as being naughty. And rather than just say, they're not doing as they're told, we need to say, well, mm. what, what has made this child respond this way? They found their uh, safe place. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if we could just touch a little bit on communication. So um, neurodiverse children and young people often have different communication styles. We see that um, social interactions can then be a little bit challenging for like a, a number of different reasons. But what strategies can you offer to support children with communication differences and the people around them so that they can build safe and, and, and kind of secure supportive relationships? I think the um, I've heard the ADHD Foundation say this as well, so I know we're we're often on the same page. And certainly for this, I've heard um, you use the term the inner eye, <laughs> that strong inner eye. And I think um, many neurodiverse um, young people have that strong. Um, not an inner eye in terms of being able to understand and recognise what's going on inside of themselves, but in a very practical way in that actually their visual memory can be very good and mm. very strong and, and quite powerful. And so I think the more we can offer at a glance communication, help children see what we're saying and not be afraid of using anything visual that drives home um, the message mm. and having it there to uh, recall and reflect on is really important and not shying away because we think our children are too old or too academically able to yeah. use visual communications. You know, here we are today using visual cues. Yeah. You know, we need them all the time and that's a strong message yeah. to get across. Yeah. And it's about, you know, ask, do, do you understand what it is I've asked of you? You know, and 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 remember that you know if you're going to give a child at least ten verbal things, they're not going to remember all ten. They can't process that amount of no. information all at once. But I also think crucial, and and you know, Amory's touched on it here. I get about three hundred emails a day, and every time I, there's no way I can get through them. And if one has an attachment on it, my heart sinks. I think, oh, here I go. I've got to read a ten-page PDF on something, and and I can't. It's just not. You know, we we're in information overload, aren't we? Mm -hmm. There's you know, there's television yeah. and screens from the minute we wake up to the minute we go to bed. Um, so what I've done now, and, and this is one of the things I love about artificial intelligence, is that you can now get AI that can produce an infographic from a document. So I say to all my staff, okay, I'll read the document, but what I need at the front of it is an infographic because I can remember images far more than I can remember lines right, of words. Yeah. So when I go on holiday, if I've been to somewhere 20 years ago, I will be able to remember my way around because I've got a fantastic visual memory. Ask me where I put my car keys this morning. It's debatable whether <laughs> I'm going to remember. So things like communicating, yeah. particularly in learning, infographics, images mm. are much, much more powerful as a as a cue for information yeah, recall. Definitely. Um, you know, learning how to revise for me was done walking. I had different walks and different directions with different routes and cue cards yeah. so that when I went into the exam room, I closed my eyes and I could remember the Absolutely. information from that visual kind of link rather yeah. than, yeah. you know, just facts. Yeah. And our, our speech and language therapy colleagues, they're so important, but you don't need a speech and language therapist to 
put some of those visuals in place to, no. to get those visual support. No. So teachers shouldn't be afraid of trying to, no, to kind of include that in their classrooms. Definitely. And often should, children yeah. create it, sorry, yeah. don't you? They, often children create it for themselves, don't they? they you know, they, they doodle little pictures to help them remember and then yeah, yeah. get told off for perhaps oh, yeah. doodling in their books. <laughs> This is one of the good things as well about, you know, the, the, the kind of resources that we this like make available for parents is parents want to help their children and want to understand their children and want to help their children learn. And how can they do that if if they don't understand? And having yeah. resources available, you know, um, to help parents understand how to actively participate in their child's education Um it is a, is I think something that schools need to do more. Yeah, We've been saying for decades. We wish parents were more involved in 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 their child's education, and then we moan when Are they want to advocate. Don't yeah, we? we moan when they advocate for their children, yeah. but actually we don't do enough um, to actually help parents learn how to be actively involved yeah. in their parents' education. So podcasts yeah. and a lot of the other resources that you have on this website are actually a, filling a real need mm -hmm. that's long overdue. Yeah. I just It's really interesting because that's, that's the next question that I was just going to think about, thinking about education and schools for our um, neurodiverse children. What advice could you give to parents who are just starting on their journey of finding the right school and the right support for their child? Visit. Yeah. <laughs> Visit, Be go informed. See. Yeah. yeah. Know Have, what your child needs. Yeah. 100%. Know what that school provides. And if you're not sure and you're not confident, go to your local parent carer forum um, or some other agency that can give you the advice and guidance that you need to navigate it because it is complicated yes. and difficult mm -hmm. and sometimes very yeah. distressing for families mm -hmm. who are worried about their child, whose child's not accessing an education, whose parents are getting criticised because their child's not accessing an education. Yeah. Help the parents do that. And parents need to have access to good quality information from yeah. a variety of sources. Mm -hmm. I, I had a lovely um, response to that very point from a family a long time ago. And they said to me, um, they decided if someone locked the door and said, I have to stay here for the day, how would I feel? And I oh, think that's an a nice measure. Yeah. 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 I've loved talking to you both today. Thank you so much. We're nearly at the end of the podcast, but we've introduced a section um, to the sensational podcast now, which are our words of wisdom. So Ooh. I'm wondering if either of you have any um, words of wisdom about this navigating neurodiversity and supporting our neurodiverse children and young people for our um, parents or carers or professionals at home. I think... You answered that before, Tony, when you said uh, get as much knowledge and yeah, information you yeah. about your child, really, that you need. And I think um, go to safe places for that. I think the internet's a wonderful facility and mind of information, but I think it's important that you are careful about the information that you do um, access mm. and access appropriate places. Mm -hmm like the uh, national charities that have got research elements um, that you can look at as well. Um, I'd like to take a, a leaf out of Ted Lasso's book and I'd say be relentlessly optimistic <laughs> about your child's potential and ability. Yeah. And, you know, I, I again, I think, you know, it, Human beings are capable of extraordinary, extraordinary things and overcoming extraordinary challenges. And the thing that makes that most possible, the energy that makes that possible is knowing that you are loved and protected. Yeah. And that, if you can provide that as a parent, your child can navigate their way through yeah. anything. Yeah. And accepted for who they are. Yeah. yeah be who you are I, I don't think we can beat Ted Lasso I'll, I'll, we'll end it there because yeah, he's one of my heroes too <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you for joining us today thanks a lot and Ryan. if you like what you've listened to today please do hit like and subscribe and hope to see you on another episode of Sensational <laughs>